Our first session will provide very important background and context for our work in response to the President's charge. We will hear from four speakers about ethical issues associated with the BRAIN initiative and ongoing work in neuroscience. And here to start us off is Dr. David Chalmers. Dr. Chalmers is a professor of philosophy and co-director of the Center for Mind, Brain, and Consciousness at NYU. He is also a distinguished professor of philosophy and the director of the Center for Consciousness at Australian National University at ANU. Uh, Dr. Chalmers is known for his work on consciousness, particularly for his formulation of the hard problem of consciousness and his arguments against materialism. He co-founded the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness and is author of a wonderfully readable book, I must say, The Conscious Mind in Search of a Fundamental Theory. Welcome, Dr. Chalmers. Thanks, Dr. Goodman, and thanks to the whole commission. It's really a privilege to be here. So I'm a philosopher interested in the connection between the brain and the mind. I take it all of us are interested in the brain primarily because it's the physical organ of the mind. That's to say, it's the physical locus of mental functions like seeing, hearing, feeling, thinking, deciding, learning, remembering, and consciousness, the subjective experience of all of that from the first person point of view. And the point of the brain initiative, I take it, isn't primarily to study the brain in its own right, fascinating though that may be, it's to uh, ultimately to understand the mind, to use the brain to uh, understand the mind both so we can treat mental disorders and so we can come to better understand who we are. So I guess, you know, one big question is, is the brain initiative going to explain the mind? Wonderful question for a, uh, for a philosopher. I suppose the short answer from my point of view is, well, no, and yes, um, no, it's not going to explain everything about the mind. But yes, it's going to tell us a whole lot and enough to make a big difference for practical purposes and enough to raise some really important ethical issues. So I thought I might just step back for a moment to look at the current state of, uh, of neuroscience and what it tells us about the mind from a philosopher's point of view and then look at how the brain initiative might affect that and the ethical issues that it raises. So there's been huge progress in cognitive neuroscience in the last couple of decades, the field that studies the brain basis of mental functions. There's been a number of drivers in that, but, uh, but one of the biggest has been the development of brain imaging techniques such as fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, which has enabled us to non-invasively get a measure of which areas of the brain are active at a given time and which are associated with different mental functions. Um, so there's been a lot of progress, but there's also been some serious limitations. Uh, I'll mention three. One limitation is just the limitations of the spatial re resolution of current imaging methods. If MRI measures blood flow rather than directly measuring neural activity, and it doesn't have the resolution to measure anything like the activity of a single neuron. Um, in fact, it, it turns out that to measure single neurons, you've got to do something like put electrodes into the skull. Uh, huge progress has been made that way um, on some really interesting studies, but there are big limitations to do that. We're limited to non-human animals and to very occasional surgical patients with uh, you know, cooperative surgeons. Um, so that's one serious limitation. Another limitation in current neuroscience is the absence of a unifying theory of brain and mind. And here, there, I think there's a real contrast with something like the Genome Project, where we came into this with a, both a solid theory in molecular biology of the molecular basis and a solid theory of the connection between molecular biology and genetics. In neuroscience now, we have nothing really analogous to that. You know, we don't have a well-established unifying theory of 
how the brain works, and we certainly don't have a well-established unifying theory of the connection between states of the brain and states of the mind. A third limitation connected to that is the philosophical mind-brain problem. I mean, it's an ancient problem in philosophy, the mind-body problem. What's the connection between the body and the mind? These days, it's basically become localized to the mind-brain problem. How is it that this organ inside our head, this three pounds of matter, somehow gives rise to and supports states of seeing, feeling, hearing, thinking, and consciousness from the first person point of view? Um, that's a philosophical problem which is gradually becoming a scientific problem. But I think it's fair to say that there are still pretty deep philosophical puzzles at the core that are so far unsolved. And although it's an area that generates a, a lot of controversy, I think it's fair to say that the consensus view in the field right now is we're not even close to having a solution to that problem right now, either from the, from the philosophy or from the, uh, or from the science. And that poses limitations too. So the bottom line then right now in current neuroscience is we have a, pretty, we have a, a developing science of correlations between states of the brain and states of the mind, fairly coarse-grained correlations for now. We don't really yet now have a science of explanation, fully explaining mental states in terms of states of the brain. Okay, so what is the brain initiative going to change here? Well, the brain initiative, as I understand it, the point is to provide a set of tools for dynamically monitoring um, neuron by neuron activity in the brain, starting with relatively simple organisms, but eventually in primates and in humans. Suppose this succeeds. I don't know what the, uh, the time frame is for this. I take it's going to be something on the order of, of decades in, uh, in humans. But suppose it succeeds and we have the ability to monitor the neuron by neuron state of a brain at the second by second dynamic level. Well, then I think we can expect much more, of course, the spatial resolution will be much better. So we'll get much more complex brain states measured, allowing us to get much more detailed correlations between states of the brain and states of the mind. It may help with theory. I mean, merely mapping the brain isn't going to give us a theory of the connection between the brain and the mind. That requires a whole lot of extra work. The hope is, I take it, the brain initiative will provide the tools to do that, but I think there's room for caution. After all, we have mapped the nervous systems of certain very simple organisms, but the researchers who have done that will tell you even after doing that, we still don't really understand how the brains of those organisms work. So there, are, there is some room for, uh, for caution there. As for the third limitation, the philosophical mind-brain problem, well, there's a lot to say about that, but um, you know, I think, again, it's not obvious that mapping the brain is going to, simply mapping the brain is going to tell us how it is that the brain supports seeing, feeling, thinking, and consciousness. There's going to remain philosophical puzzles, one of which you could pose by thinking about, uh, just say you give a, a blind person a complete map of the brain, and it's neuron by neuron state, the brain of somebody seeing color. Will this tell them what it's like to see red? You can argue no. So there's some kind of explanatory gap between the state of the brain and the, the conscious experience. Maybe mapping the brain is going to provide us with the new insights that it takes to, uh, to solve this philosophical problems. But it's not obvious. And if you ask me, uh, my money is that even after mapping the brain, you know, some elements of that philosophical mind-brain problem are still going to be with us. So that's the bad news. Now, the good news is I think the brain initiative still has the potential to give us a really good science of correlations between the brain and the mind. Studying brain states in the kind of detail that the brain initiative promises in the context of behavior and mental function opens up the possibility of correlating really complex and specific states of the brain with complex and specific states of the mind, of thinking and feeling and so on. Not just correlates of you know, of seeing and thinking and, and feeling in general, but of you know, seeing the Eiffel Tower and thinking of your mother and so on. That won't solve all the mysteries of the mind, but it'll be enough for many practical purposes and enough to pose some of the most serious ethical challenges. So to close, um, maybe I could just mention one of the, uh, the relevant ethical challenges here, which is the challenge of privacy. Uh, mental states 
are traditionally private, um, known most directly to their subjects, and only communicated when subjects let them show through in behavior. And brain imaging is gradually changing that. Uh, we can now look at brains directly. There's a famous recent study where a subject diagnosed with vegetative state has been put in the brain scanner, and, and people have been able to make inferences about certain states of consciousness, and that apparently um, in that person that people thought were previously incapable of such states. But the brain initiative could really change this. I mean, imagine we have the capacity to monitor really detailed, complex, and specific brain states, and we have a background account of mind-brain correlations that will give us the ability to monitor detailed mental states. And now the ethical issues, I take it, are obvious. I mean, you talked about, you've been talking about incidental findings here. Well, you know, I mean, here's an incidental finding. You know, you've got your research subject in the, uh, in the scanner, you read off their brain state. Turns out they killed someone. Or they've got a memory of killing someone. Or it turns out they're planning to kill someone. Okay, well, what do you do with that? Nearer term, maybe that's science fiction. Nearer term, similar issues are raised by getting at the neural correlates of anger or depression or sexual attraction. Do there need to be limitations on the use of, uh, of um, brain imaging methods in light of these, uh, of these ethical issues about application? Well, that's one, that's one for you, so I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. Well, I will pass right now uh, because time is limited, um, among other reasons, right? We now, thank you very much. It was very lucid and a great way to begin. Uh, now I'd like to turn to Dr. Walter Koroschatz, who is Deputy Director of the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke at the, at the NIH. Dr. Koroschatz has served as co-director of the Joint Uniform Services University, NIH Intramural Research Center for Traumatic Brain Injury, and is acting director of a new NIH Office of Emergency Care Research. Dr. Koroschatz also served as a professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School, vice chair of neurology and director of stroke and neurointensive care at the Massachusetts General Hospital and was a member of the Huntington Disease Unit. In the latter position, he pioneered pre-symptomatic testing for persons at risk for Huntington's disease, addressing the ethical questions that the new genetic technology posed. Welcome, Dr. Koroshevs. Thank you very much. Thanks to the committee. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk very quickly and try and uh, hone in on what I think the new technologies are. And uh, so I think if you forget about brain, what it means, just think of the end, neurotechnology. I think that's the focus, and that's what I'm going to particularly talk about. So I'm going to pose the ethical issues as not new, but basically revisions of what you've seen in the past. So. Uh, when I talk about interrogating the nervous system and then modifying the nervous system. So interrogating the nervous system, we've been doing it for many years. Here's an example from the 30s, the first lie detector test. This is the lie detector of the modern age uh, with functional magnetic resonance imaging, which Dr. Chalmers mentioned, where in this experiment they find with high accuracy that they can detect from areas of brain that light up when someone is lying. So just an example, interrogating the nervous system for a, for a discrete purpose. The second one is changing the nervous system to change behavior. Now, we're going to talk about stimulation, but in fact, we change the nervous system all the time and through a number of different ways, experience being the major one, drugs being another one. Stimulation is directly affecting neural circuits, usually through some electrical uh, intervention. So, 1938, electroconvulsive therapy, first used in a human patient in Italy for depression. I don't know if anyone's seen the effects, but electroconvulsive therapy can just be amazing in terms of returning someone from a, a really a fatal depressive condition to a functional human being within a day. It's, it's really quite amazing. But in the current time frame, I show you what's happening now, and that is interrogating the nervous system. This is a Helen Mayberg's work to find an area of the brain that's overactive based on blood flow PET scanning in depressed people. Uh, 
finding that those people remain in that area hyperactive despite antidepressants, but then putting an electrode, turning on electric current in that area, which you see here as this SCC25, this subcolossal area, turning on electricity, <clears throat> which is supposedly a brain stimulation, but it's not stimulating the brain, it's just throwing current into the brain. Whatever happens, happens. What happens is that actually the activity goes down and the patient recovers. So brain stimulation, in fact, is electrical current, but it's actually not, as far as we can tell, stimulating the brain, it's actually turning off the brain. A semantic issue that we'll get into, but the point here is that the current way in which the brain is stimulated, even in the finest tuned situation, is still quite crude. You're just throwing electrons in and seeing what happens. So the brain initiative is really based on developing new technologies as far as we understand it. Now, NIH is a granting agency, so what actually happens depends on a bunch of processes, the end of which is usually peer review, determining what is the most meritorious science to go after in this space. And there is a committee that's now working to try and develop what the space should be. I think the key thing, which I think the, uh, my colleagues from National Science Foundation, DARPA, can can speak to better is that, that the, the movement that we need to make is not purely based on biology, but it's based on taking the best science from material science, from engineering, mathematics, chemistry, and applying it to understand how the brain is functioning, developing new tools for understanding how the brain is functioning. There is now a planning committee. They have four public meetings. Interestingly, I think this gives you an idea of where they're going. The first meeting was on molecular approaches. So how do you get genes into the brain that will turn on certain proteins that, that then are uh, reporters of brain activity is one. Um, the second one is large-scale recording technologies. Um, how do you record from large areas of brain? We now, people developed Nobel Prize, won Nobel Prizes from understanding how the visual system by putting electrodes in and recording one neuron at a time in particular areas. To understand how the brain works, the brain is totally interconnected and that, that spatial um, uh, confinement of the electrode really only gets you to see you know, the needle and you miss the entire forest. Uh, the second one is big data and computational, the third one is big data and computational methods meeting because as we're going into this, as you'll see, we're going to be obtaining data from large number of neurons from the large-scale recording technologies that are coming. And the question is, what does it all mean? What's the correlations? What are the causal, causal features that define the circuits that we're interested in? And the fourth meeting, which is yet to come, is, based, is looking at human measurements and analysis. So a lot of this stuff is going to be pre-human at least, I think, for the first couple of decades. But I think we can say that the, the, the patients with diseases will push scientists to try to bring these technologies into the human uh, condition for particular diseases, Parkinson's, depression, some of the things that we use DBS for, the tremor, I'll, I'll show you a couple of others. So what's breaking now in terms of technologies? Well, we're going into I'm going to break it into three areas. One is direct recording of neural circuit activity. So previously this was done by an electrode going into one cell, recording how the cell is firing. Now we have dyes that can be put into cells either through viral vectors or through transgenic approaches that, that these dyes will then light up when the cells become active. These are oftentimes calcium-sensitive dyes which give the best signal, voltage-sensitive dyes, which would then go along with each cell firing, would be the best. Their, their signal-to-noise now is not, is not as good as the calcium dyes, so a lot of the work now is with calcium dyes. But there's potential that you'll have a dye, a voltage-activated dye, that you can then see light emit when that cell uh, fires an action potential. And that's the, you know, that is the dollar in the nervous system is action potentials how cells fire, and then move information from one cell to another. The way in which uh, people are working now to record from large number of neurons is through nets of electrodes. So electrodes are detecting electrical activity in the brain. Um, they're used commonly in patients 
for epilepsy surgery staging to identify where seizures are occurring, but they can detect uh, normal activity in these patients. People are undergoing certain cognitive tests, and you can see the neural circuit activity related to a certain response. So these are useful therapeutically, but in the context of a therapeutic use, one can also interrogate the nervous system for other reasons. Um, there are now nano uh, uh, electrodes that are being developed with, that are really, really tiny, that go into brain, do not cause um, any kind of disruption of the, of the nervous system, and can collect act activity from many, many neurons, single cell, single neurons at a time. There are some futuristic ideas um, where you can use potentially DNA as a barcode recorder for, for electrical activity. If, the, if there's a calcium signal that affects a mutation in DNA, you could actually think of the DNA being used as the old paper chart for electrical activity as it goes by. So people are working on these type of nano devices. In terms of direct stimulation of neuron and circuits, the big new uh, technology is optogenetics. Optogenetics occurs from the introduction of genes that are code for light-activated channels or receptors. So recall that in the nervous system, activity in the, of, of the neurons is caused by opening of channels that allow iron to flow. It turns out that there are basic science and single-cell organisms found light-activated channels. The genes were identified. They, you can now put them into neurons. And then if you turn the light on, you will activate those neurons in which you have these channels. And this can be done with exquisite precision. You can actually attach these to promoters that are specific for certain neuronal groups. So you can actually specifically turn on dopamine neurons, specifically turn on GABA neurons. This gives the type of stimulation that is so much more refined over the deep brain stimulation where you turn on the current a million things are happening, you don't know what they are. Here you have the neuron under your control. So very interesting new technology, just a couple of years old, and with two photon optogenetics, you can actually go down and activate one neuron at a time. So really exquisite ability to uh, activate neurons with this new genetic technology. The last thing <coughs> is that that's happening is that our understanding of anatomy of the, of the human brain and, and animal brains is coming into a new, a new uh, zone. So this is one example of a new technology just out a year. It's called Clarity. Here's a mouse brain. As you can see, you cannot see through the mouse brain. So if you want to image, you know, the cells and the pathways, you cannot do that in the, in the mouse brain. Uh, but there's a technology now to make it transparent. And this is just an example of what this looks like. Uh, just bear me with a second. You see, this is a 3D image of this translucent mouse brain that's been uh, stained with a particular antibody stain. And you can go right into the brain and see in all its 3D um, uh, magnificence uh, down to single cell level. So a technology that is really quite amazing right now. Uh, in the human, I'm just going to show one more thing. The technology that's breaking is the ability to look at the white matter connections between brain. Previously, we've not been able to really say or tell which fibers are going where. Most of the human brain is white matter, not gray matter. Um, those are the wires that connect the different parts of the brain. They're now, with this new diffusion technology, diffusion tension imaging, becoming visible. So I'm going to end there. Um, I think that the, the take-home point is New technologies, that's what the Brain Initiative is going to be about. It's going to allow interrogation of the nervous system and manipulation of the nervous system, primarily in animals, but at some point, people are really going to try to make that leap into the human as we have done in the past. So thanks very much. Thank you very much. We will hear next from Dr. John Wingfield, who is Assistant Director for Biological Sciences at the National Science Foundation. He has also served as Division Director for Integrative Organismal Systems from the University of California, Davis. His research focuses on neural pathways for environmental signals affecting seasonality in birds and their mechanisms of coping with environmental stress. Birds 
also get stressed, not just we, apparently. Dr. Wingfield has served on several editorial boards and has <clears throat> held positions as associate director or editor-in-chief for major journals in his field. Welcome, Dr. Fing Wingfield. Thank you, Dr. Gutman, and thank you to all of you for the opportunity here to uh, talk a little bit about the, the National Science Foundation and uh, the, the Brain Initiative. I'd like to start out just by um, reminding everybody that um, NSF is uh, a funding agency where we make awards related to basic research, fundamental research, and in the biology directorate, this is uh, related to health, uh, food, energy, and environment. So actually the brain does have relevance to those other areas as well, which I can talk about later if people are, are interested. Um, having said that, let's um, focus now on, on uh, the brain initiative. And uh, as we've already heard, this is focusing uh, initially on neurotechnologies, uh, the foundational knowledge tools for higher resolution <coughs> measurements, uh, computational models and theoretical frameworks, as Dr. Chalmers pointed out. Uh, but also the data issues, data storage, management, and analysis. It's not entirely clear how we're going to move forward with those. So the NSF role, as we see it, that we are uniquely positioned because we have seven directorates, engineering and other science domains, and social, behavioral, and economic sciences, that we can bring together in various combinations um, to uh, advance tool development, but also educate the workforce needed for the BRAIN initiative to succeed. Uh, several decades down down the road. So specifically what we, we are supporting right now are uh, um, determining the genomic architecture, such as the um, patterns of gene expression, but also the epigenome. We, we know from research in animals that environment has huge uh, influences on how brains develop, um, as well as down to the level of synaptic activity, neural circuitry, uh, so we are, are focused very much on developing molecular probes, uh, improved ability to sense and record neural network activity, imaging, and related nanotechnologies. Um, we also are uh, working to establish conceptual and theoretical frameworks. In fact, there, we have a, a, a workshop coming up in March next year, organized by the Directorate for Mathematical and Physical Sciences, which will be focused precisely on how we develop these theoretical frameworks. Um, then going on to uh, social, behavioral, and economic sci uh, uh, sciences, cognitive neuroscience, linking brain activity patterns to cognitive and behavioral functions in specific ecological, evolutionary development, and social contexts, and applying social science theories to methods to link brain activity to actual human behaviors. Uh, there's an awful lot of science coming together here, particularly from the engineers in developing new uh, sensors, nano sensors, uh, where we can actually follow uh, animals in the field as they go about their everyday um, uh, activities, uh, feeding, uh, reproducing, avoiding predators, and so forth. And it's not that far away that we'll be able to do the same with humans. One uh, final example here, before I talk about the, the ethical concerns, this comes from engineering, um, where um, a lot of interface of engineering with the, other sci with the science domains. Uh, this one is from an engineering research uh, center that developed a retinal prosthesis, uh, for, particularly for patients with uh, retinitis pigmentosa. And uh, a video camera fixed to glasses can um, transmit information to this prosthesis on the retina and uh, uh, the patient can actually uh, recognize some letters, improve mobility, uh, object localization, motion detection, and so forth. This is just one example. Uh, we had a workshop uh, last week with the engineers um, engineering the brain, which was just phenomenal. But I would say at least half of that conference was focused on, on ethical um, issues. So moving on to that, um, how do we manage or regulate rapidly evolving technologies? Um, th this is something that's just really beginning to sink in at the National Science Foundation, that uh, the, the regulations and management uh, issues of today will be very different tomorrow as these uh, technologies develop. 
do we need different principles to guide ethical policies? Um, in neurotechnology, this could include intelligence, defense, medical, personal. I would put in there from the uh, NSF perspective, environment and agricultural as well. Uh, should there be a distinction based on the intent of the use, treatment versus, versus enhancement? This was a major issue at the workshop last week of uh, um, to what extent uh, brain enhancement, cognitive enhancement would be possible in the future. Uh, one example given is that uh, today we're worried about baseball players using steroids to enhance performance. Uh, tomorrow it may be enhancements of uh, perception and motor responses uh, in both pitchers and hitters. Who will manage these policies? Uh, when and where should neuroethics education start? Um, the, some of the studies the Commission has uh, um, uh, supported have said this should start in high school, but in, in NSF we, we are focused mostly on undergraduate and graduate education, and that this is something that uh, we're beginning to talk about now. In fact, how uh, we can um, uh, update, revise, and improve undergraduate education across the sciences, particularly biological sciences. Some bioethical concerns that are um, particularly of importance to the National Science Foundation, and these are, this is dual-use research of concern. This came out of um, a, uh, a recent uh, study on H5N1. Uh, there were two studies, one to be published, was published in Nature, another one in Science, um, concerning the uh, working on potentially very uh, pathological organisms and also uh, organisms that produce toxins. This now is starting to expand and will cover many other aspects of biology. And in fact, we're starting to see dual use research of concern in many other areas as well, which includes, I think, uh, um, brain re research in, in the future. The dual use research of concern, what that means is that um, the technologies were developed for good purposes but they ha there is the possibility that they can be used, uh, particularly in bioterrorism and so forth, uh, in the future. So that's where the dual use comes from. Synthetic biology, uh, the Commission has already issued a report in 2010 on this. But again, synthetic biology is something we fund an awful lot of, the basic r research that goes behind this. Uh, synthesizing lifelike systems. Uh, that make things for us, but also nanosensors that can be infused, injected into organisms and ultimately humans as well. We already heard about microelectrodes and so forth, which are also coming out of synthetic biology. Um, animal science is one that uh, we are uh, concerned about because we do fund a lot of basic research. Um, there are an awful lot of regulations that come out of the uh, Office of uh, Laboratory Animal Welfare at NIH and also the Institute for Laboratory uh, Animal Research. Um, but we fund an awful lot of research on wild animals, animals that are actually moving around and operating under natural conditions. And uh, it's not always entirely clear that the guidelines for use of laboratory animals are even relevant to wild animals. And this causes a tremendous amount of concern amongst uh, uh, animal writers and the public in general. And there are some very ethical issues, I think, especially as we're looking at using nano sensors that can be followed from space. Uh, protecting human subjects, of course, is, is also an issue. Uh, again, the Commission released a report in December. This is very linked, I feel, to animal science and the sorts of technologies that we are developing that will be applicable to humans in the near future. One um, issue, too, that's developing is a major concern for us uh, is the brain-machine interface. Um, invasive versus non-invasive interface. Implants, that we've already seen an example of that. Brain stimulation and augmentation, prosthetics, and mind control. Uh, all of these the, uh, are things we are now uh, beginning to address as a foundation, and um, uh, we, we uh, hope to uh, see more guidance and, and leadership from the Commission here, because I think the, the seven science domains in engineering that we have at the National Science Foundation is, is developing such a complex issue uh, 
related to the brain and the ethical concerns underlying it. Uh, that and this is going to be very, very plastic and changing constantly in the future. So I think we have a huge challenge here. So um, future steps, improving accountability, ethical underpinnings of regulation should be explicit. Investor obligations should be explicit in policies and regulations and engagement by the communities, not just the, the funding agencies like us, but research, the institutions, private foundations, uh, industry itself, and non-governmental uh, organizations, the students, and of course, the public at large. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Our cleanup hitter here, who concludes this panel before we open it up for questions, is Dr. William K. Spear. Dr. K. Spear is a program manager in the Defense Sciences Office at DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, where he develops science and technology dealing with the neurobiology and psychology of training, education, and influence. During his 24-year service in the Air Force, Dr. K. Spear served as an intelligence officer and as associate professor at the United States Air Force Academy. He is the author of Nat Natural Ethical Facts, Evolution, Connectionism, and Moral Cognition. And his current research includes work on neuroethics, the evolution of morality, the intersections of cognitive science and national security policy, philosophy of mind, and military ethics. Quite a combination. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Gutman. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate the invitation to talk before the uh, commission about these important issues. Um, like our other two partners uh, in the BRAIN initiative, the NSF and the NIH, DARPA, I think has an important role to play in funding and guiding uh, BRAIN initiative related work. And uh, when you mention DARPA, you may immediately ask what interest does the Department of Defense have in brain sciences? So let me revisit for you briefly what DARPA's mission is. So. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency was founded in the wake of Sputnik's launch. Uh, we found ourselves strategically surprised by an adversary that had developed a technology uh, that was a game changer uh, in the national security domain. So our mission is to prevent strategic surprise like that from happening again, and where possible to enable our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines to create it and our adversaries so that we can prevail uh, on the battlefield and ideally prevent battles from happening at all. So that's DARPA's mission. Given that human beings are an integral part of warfare, uh, it's no surprise then that for the reasons Dr. Chalmers outlined quite well, uh, the brain being an important driver of behavior, that the Department of Defense would be interested in developing neurotechnologies. So, some caveats I should place then on uh, the type of work that I'll talk about in the next uh, eight and a half minutes is that DARPA is a fast and lean organization. So some of the programs and efforts I'll mention to you, probably by the time uh, a report is issued from this uh, uh, commission, uh, may very well have uh, been transitioned and gone on their merry way. Um, and other uh, programs and initiatives that I don't mention today will likely be started. So, DARPA is very much driven by the passion and expertise of the particular program managers who are brought on board uh, to uh, make their vision for developing technologies to give warfighters new capabilities um, a reality. So let's first begin then with the what uh, uh, we intend to do in the neuroscience domain inside of DARPA. So I think a useful way to think about this is to lump our work into four separate categories. First of all, we can use our efforts in neuroscience to help us understand how we protect, repair, and restore uh, the brains and minds of warfighters. So think of someone who's deployed multiple times downrange into harm's way, who's experienced multiple uh, traumatic brain injuries. Is there some way we can use findings in the neuroscience and the brain initiative to help them uh, recover from those injuries so they can live a, a normal life? So protect, repair, and restore is one important aspect of our neuroscience work. Uh, programs that come to mind here are things like the Remind and RAM programs. Those are both contrived acronyms uh, that deal with programs that look at the neural correlates of memory, how memories are encoded, how they are recalled, with the idea that we might be able to build, uh, to build a device that will help you jump the gap in case of brain injury. So if somebody sustains 
hippocampal damage, which means they can no longer recall their past. Is there any way we can build a uh, multi-input, multi-output device or implant that could help restore those missing connections so that that person could uh, have a normal system of memory again. So those are uh, very important parts of uh, brain initiative work given the types of injuries that warfighters face in the battlefield. And this, of course, extends to the non-visible uh, damage that warfighters sustain in conflict, including all the uh, diagnostic and statistical manual diagnosable mental illnesses that uh, warfighters can suffer from. So I would fully expect that DARPA would develop brain initiative related work that would let us use remind and RAM-like devices, perhaps, uh, to treat uh, DSM-4 and 5 diagnosable mental illnesses. Second major area, leveraging the brain. All right, so first is protecting, repairing, and restoring. Second is leveraging. Are there signals, for instance, that the brain produces that we can uh, monitor and use so as to give the warfighter better capabilities in the battlefield? So one example of this is a program called NIA, neurotechnology for intelligence analysts that's actually coming to an end. It's lived its full lifespan, where we used electroencephalograms, so EEGs, to monitor electrical activity over the surface of the scalp, so as to look for signals related to detection of objects and images that imagery analysts in the intelligence community may not have otherwise been aware they were seeing. So if you've got thousands of miles of photographs from overhead satellites to look at, for instance, as part of your daily work. Um, is there some way we can look for a signal that lets us know, oh, these 5% of those thousands of miles are important to examine if you're looking for a particular surface-to-air missile site, for instance, so you can understand the threat. Uh, so that's an example of leveraging uh, the brain uh, to give the warfighter a cap an important capability. Uh, third significant area is augment the brain. Uh, that is, uh, brains and minds don't come preloaded to perform well on the battlefield, if you will, right? So uh, we have a process, training and education, that uh, takes someone's mind and brain and gives it additional capability uh, through a process that's normally pedagogical in nature. So can we use our understanding of the brain to help us develop better teaching and learning tools that use those signals I mentioned earlier uh, to help us augment the capacity of brains. An example here is a program called Accelerated Learning, and it, which looked at the neural differences between novice and expert performance in multiple domains, and then tried to develop technologies that made novice brains look like expert brains more quickly in areas like uh, uh, group performance and second language learning. And one of the uh, images that Dr. Korshet showed in his presentation was actually from a lab that was funded underneath this program, uh, Walt Schneider's lab at the University of Pittsburgh that used diffuse and temperature imaging to help us trace out some of those white matter tracks uh, that are responsible for connectivity between large parts of the brain. Finally and fourth, uh, we have the emulate notion. So by studying the brain well, we might be able to emulate the things that the brain does very well. We have a pretty amazing uh, three-pound universe, uh, as, as Dr. Chalmers pointed out, sitting on top of our spinal cord. Um, and it operates at very low wattages, uh, produces, all oh, with the things being equal, relatively little heat, and yet does amazing computations, incredible computations. Um, enables us to uh, get around in the social world, uh, reason morally and ethically, um, make judgments and decisions that have important consequences. So can we study the brain more closely to help build computational systems that are artificial that might emulate uh, the strengths of the brain? So those are the four major uh, buckets of research that I anticipate DARPA would continue to invest in, keeping in mind the caveats I mentioned earlier about program manager expertise and passion. So how we can do that, I think, is to break our explorations up into two general domains. And here I'll use engineering speak, looking at transducers and effectors. Are there technologies we can develop that will help us translate those signals in the brain into something that's usable to help us in theory development or technology development? And then are there a novel effectors uh, that we can develop that will help us intervene in the brain, say in the case of uh, clinical pathology, uh, to correct a condition and restore someone to normal functioning? 
Now, developing effective transducers and effectors is something DARPA has always been interested in and has always invested in. It has downstream consequences for everything ranging from big data, right? You're going to have to develop a, a way to harness angstrom to meter style databases that will help you build that unified theory that uh, David mentioned in his uh, second point in his presentation that kicked off the panel. Uh, on over to um, new types of technologies that will let us change those brain states uh, quickly and uh, efficiently, especially in the case of pathology. Now, you may think that, in a sense, we are out at sea in a sieve when we think about the ethics of that whole enterprise, of what I've mentioned to you in the last seven minutes. Where I want to end in my last minute is to suggest that we're not at sea in a sieve, that we can use a lot of the traditional principles and standards from bio, uh, 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 medical ethics and military ethics to help see our way through to a framework for thinking about the ethics of these issues. So when people grade diamonds, they talk about the four C's, color, cut, clarity, uh, and uh, carat weight. And I would argue that in the ethics domain, we can consider at least three C's, the C's of character, consent, and consequence. On the character side, drawn in the wisdom of Aristotle and Plato, are the neurotechnologies we're developing enhancing human flourishing rather than standing in its way. On the consent side, drawing from theories of Immanuel Kant and respect for persons, are we obtaining consent both on the experimental side and when we use these technologies are the subjects uh, and uh, human beings interacting with technologies aware of their impact. So are we respecting autonomy? And finally, on the consequential side, the third C, uh, consideration of Mill-style utilitarian concerns, uh, are we doing all we can to ensure that our neurotechnologies have good consequences? We have the traditional mechanisms in place in DARPA to help us think about those issues, including an LC-style review before every program is launched. Of course, we follow the traditional IRB regulations as well as having a second-level Department of Defense review, and our program managers are empowered to impanel panels of experts in their programs that provide advice on all three of those Cs. We look forward to hearing from the committee about how we can improve the way we think about uh, ethics in the context of neuroscience and the brain initiative, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Wonderful set of comments. And I'll begin with a, a question for any or all of the panelists and then open it up for other commission members for their question. Uh, so it's a follow-up to what I think everybody here uh, not only agrees but is passionately interested in doing, which is to make sure that we simultaneously enable the best of neuroscience to move forward and at the same time make sure it's ethical science so that uh, nobody uh, a decade or two decades or 50 years from now looks back and says, what were they thinking, um, meaning not that we should have done a neurological image of their brain, but meaning that they were in just what is some commonsensical, ethical way um, doing something which, to quote uh, the New York Times article on Guatemala, you know, that became so relevant to the Guatemala case was ethically impossible. Um, so, uh, or why weren't they thinking ethically and scientifically? You all um, expressed uh, concerns for the science going forward and it, for it going forward ethically. So my question is very simple. What do you think um, is the most important um, potentially neglected um, ethics of your science. Uh, I, I just say, I think uh, Dr. Casebeer is, I think is absolutely right. We don't, it's not that there need to be new ethical principles invented here, uh, but there does need to be at least public, not at least, there needs to be not only internal but public assurance that this science is going forward ethically. And I just 
it's our job to answer that question eventually, but it's we have you, and I'd like you to say what, what you think is you know, one of the most important ethical considerations that you, you are potentially concerned about. I might call on, uh, well. yes, but I will call on Dr. Korshitz if he doesn't answer because I think I, I, I didn't catch what you thought in the neurological, you know, in what you do, but let's start with, um, with John Wingfield. One issue that, that's really struck me is that I think all of us agree that we should continue to fund basic research without any limitations and so forth. Uh, and uh, um, I'd like to give one example as to the example Dr. Koroshetz gave with um, optogenetics, that those ion channels, those calcium channels that are hooked up to rhodopsins, light-sensitive proteins, were um, first identified in algae. And this was NSF-funded basic research. So one of the components of the tool came from a totally unexpected area. You know, TAC polymerase that's used a lot in uh, molecular biology came from work that was done on bacteria in hot springs mm -hmm. in, in Yellowstone. So we, we are uh, funding a lot of basic research here. Sometimes it's immediately obvious where that has applications. Sometimes it sits dormant for 20 years and then emerges. But uh, then you have these brilliant people like Dizeroth who pull all this together and develop a new, new technique. And um, I don't think any of us would want to inhibit that, but ethical issues that then arise from that kind of research, uh, uh, how do we prepare for that, not knowing <laughs> what might be emerging? And um, the, uh, m my colleagues in the Directorate for Mathematics and Physical Sciences say, well, this is rather similar to situations 70 years ago now when uh, um, uh, the nuclear bomb was first developed and that heralded the age of, of nuclear power. Um, are we thinking, what were they thinking back then? But I think there's been a lot of... Uh, uh, good applications of in nuclear medicine, for example, and it, it we have been able to keep it under control, sort of, uh, mm -hmm. until now. But how do we think that that's something I I find of concern in, at the NSF, where we have all of this fundamental research that could give rise to anything, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think um, you know the things that I would be worried about are replays of what's happened in the past, but now instead of clubs, we have, you know, machine guns to worry about. <laughs> so if you think about ECT, um, it went through various phases. Um, I think that that could repeat itself, uh, but it could, you know, not just be depression. It could be other areas where there's evidence that affecting the nervous system will have some outcome which people judge to be good and uh, you know that could get out of control uh, particularly I think if people don't quite understand what the issues are the expectations are you know incorrect you know can I change your memory by putting a chip in your head um, a lot of people will go to China to have stem cells put in to treat their Alzheimer's with no evidence that it works so I think that, that's the kind of scary part in terms of affecting the nervous system. The enhancement issue is, is worrisome. I mean, you develop skills by changing how your brain is, is wired and connected. So now we're going to be able to interrogate the nervous system, find out how that happens, and there are good things. So we're looking at stroke recovery. We should be able to find out how the brain rewires after stroke to give you a good functional outcome. But you could also imagine that some foreign government could use some virtual reality testing looking at feedback from the nervous system to turn a person into something that they weren't before for some other purpose. So, so I think the power to uh, affect the nervous system is going to change dramatically, but it, it, may, it may be decades as opposed to years. So I think those are the the areas, the enhancement, the interrogation nervous system, you could potentially look at people and get 
behavioral profiles and, you know, you want to marry somebody who's, you know, very friendly and equanimity, you know, there's a scan that tells you that's the kind of person for you or do you want to, so there's lots of things. Sounds pretty good to me. Go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That was very helpful. Seriously, very helpful. Dr. Casebeard, did you want to? Yeah, one uh, quick comment is my concerns are more generic. I think, but they are twofold. Uh, first is just the potential for misuse. So where I worry about the misuse of the basic science, uh, both uh, by uh, commercial entities uh, and by uh, actual and potential adversaries. Uh, the second thing I worry about is overinterpretation of the results. So um, I think neuroscience work uh, in the popular mind is very uh, attractive and that we can often attribute uh, certainty to it that might result in us moving out quickly on a technological development we ought not to. Uh, so, but, but that cuts both ways, right? Uh, we have a charge in DARPA especially uh, to wear the white hats, if you will, and step in to prevent misuse and to uh, develop technologies to uh, address adversaries who are trying to use the technology in a nefarious fashion. Good. I know that John Aris is on the phone has a question for Dr. Chalmers, so I'm going to ask him, but I just want to underline something that Dr. Casebeer just said, which is the overinterpretation of results, because that is in science fiction. That is happening already, and I think there's a real scientific and ethical convergence of concern and interest there, um, which we may be able to at least speak to and make some, some suggestions about. John Aris, are you on the phone? Uh, I, Amy, uh, I am. Can you hear me? We can, loud and clear. Oh, great. Okay. So uh, I want to thank our speakers for a really uh, thoughtful and, and clear-headed exposition of these issues. Um, and I'm sorry I can't be with you in person today. Um, but here's, here's what's troubling me. In, in a way, this is really a kind of gloss on Amy's uh, question just now. Uh, as I as a layperson in this area trying to get educated, I go to Amazon.com uh, and I notice really an explosion of interest and in literature in what's come to be called neuroethics. Uh, scores and scores of books. Uh, there are now uh, societies uh, devoted to the exploration of ethical issues. But, you know, somebody uh, who has been around for a long time, a bit long in the tooth, like myself, um, might suspect that a lot of this is hype, okay? Uh, for example, uh, it's been claimed that the use of fMRI in the courtroom will have revolutionary results and cast doubt on our traditional notions of responsibility uh, and freedom. And this has spawned a counter-movement, I guess, uh, people like Sally Sattel are arguing uh, that a lot of these ethical issues that are being raised are based on hype, you know, or on uh, uh, vast uh, overextensions of what we actually know. Uh, so they're arguing that this is all or mostly hype. So I would ask this panel and Dr. Chalmers in particular to help guide us or to help us separate the wheat from the chaff, right? Uh, what do you take to be the really enduring, important problems uh, generated by this kind of research? And what do you take to be really sort of, you know, uh, exaggerations or dead ends that we'll regret having spent time on? Well, I guess what we find in areas like this is that there is a lot of uh, hype and uh, overstatement. That's uh, Typically in the short term, I think people have a lot of incentive to uh, over-exaggerate the, uh, the pace of, uh, of progress, for, whether it's for funding or commercial or self-interested uh, purposes. So you hear a lot of, a lot of um, what's out there in the press just comes from people who, uh, who speak the loudest. But I mean, I think a lot of the times that's just a matter of degree. So you'll hear that uh, something is happening now when in fact it's, uh, it's not happening now, but maybe it's going to happen in a... Uh, in a couple of decades' time, uh, so for a philosopher, all that is, uh, well, that's just what that's just you know, the, that's just a few seconds in the uh, in the pace of, of history. And I think uh, today's hype often ends up being tomorrow's 
reality. Um, you know, can we right now do uh, do mind reading? No, not to any uh, uh, with a brain image. No, not in any uh, particularly effective way. You can get signals as to the, the, ver the very broad character of the kind of mental state which a person is in. You know, um, in one of these famous studies, you can tell whether certain areas are active if they're engaged in spatial imagination or motor imagination. Imagining walking through the house or imagining playing tennis. Can you, uh, can you look at someone's brain and tell what they're thinking? No, ab no uh, absolutely not, although there are people who are trying to promote technologies to, uh, to that effect. But might we be able to do this in, uh, in a few decades once we've got the kinds of technologies which the Brain Initiative promises to, uh, to map out states of the brain, neuron by neuron, and correlate them with, uh, with states of the mind? Well, maybe. So, uh, like I say, so hype today, but 20, 30 years' time, maybe reality. I just yeah. add there is an experiment which is very primitive, but you can record from the hippocampus in a rat and, and tell from the, where the, what the pattern of brain firing is where the rat is in a maze. So that's a very primitive kind of approach to what you're saying. And we'll, we'll, <clears throat> we'll come back to some of this in our roundtable discussion. I have a list of people questioned, and we'll get as many as we can, and then we'll have a chance later this morning. Jim, you're next on my list. Let me a uh, quick question, and if it's too long an answer, we can move this also. Uh, Dr. Chalmers, you can answer on your own right, and I would like you to. Uh, the other three of you all represent agencies that are funding this kind of research. I'd be interested in your assessment of the degree to which the researchers you fund are actually sensitive to the several um, uh, ethics, bioethics issues that each of you mentioned. Uh, you started with privacy and we ended up with three C's and there was a bunch of things uh, in between. And secondly, what do you three in particular imagine, well all of you, imagine the role of funding agencies ought to be to ensure that in, in research like this, or research broadly, uh, that ethical considerations are in the forefront of the protocols that, uh, that these researchers are proposing? Well, I would say two things. One is the people who are developing the technologies are not thinking ethics. They're real engineers. They're hardcore scientists. The people who are working in the human realm are heavily thinking about ethics. And I think the review committees, as they review grants, ethics is high up on the list. I don't know if Christine wants to comment. But, Doc, can I just say, when you said they're real engineers, the vice chair of our commission is a real engineer, and he thinks ethically as well as scientifically. So that is a challenge. I mean, it sh we would argue that to be a real scientist and a real engineer, you must also think ethically. Otherwise, you're going to do things. You won't even know whether what you're doing is a legitimate enterprise. I, I'm not, believe me, uh, I, what you said I think is absolutely an accurate response to um, Jim Wagner's question, but it is our joint mission to make the idea of being a real engineer and a real scientist include having an ethical, you know, part of the ethical part of your brain firing as well as the scientific part of your brain firing. And I'd say that metaphorically, not, <laughs> not neurologically speaking. I'm interested in yes, sure. Yes, um, um, I, I agree that a lot of the PIs who are developing the, the straight technologies, the core components of, of these tools, are, are not always thinking um, uh, about ethics. But one thing that really struck me was at the uh, engineering the brain uh, meeting we had last week with the engineers, that uh, because this was focused on, on human brain, uh, 50% of the meeting was a debate on the neuroethics. It was really very, very interesting and, and uh, the, the potential misuse that all of you have, have brought up here. Um, also, w with the hype and so forth, which uh, I think all of us have to, to deal with from time to time, I've, I've generally found that at least in the biology directorate of panels, the PIs cut right through that. And uh, they, they try to, to set the record straight, but sometimes reporters don't always listen. Um, uh, for, for different, <laughs> as we all know. Um, <clears throat> as for uh, what, what we are trying to put in, in place 
for this. We, we, we fund research, so we don't actually do any research at NSF, uh, except in our own labs back at our institutions. Uh, so we, we feel we have uh, a dialogue with the institutions. And um, they are responsible as well, to a certain extent, about what their faculty do. And um, you know, if you are funding uh, people in, in industry and, and uh, non-governmental uh, offices that are not academic, then this becomes even more complex. You know, I, I think we, we're just starting to address that issue. I mean, we have all the animal care and use uh, um, uh, ethical issues that we have a good system going with the institutional animal care and use committees, but beyond that, there's not a whole lot. Thanks. I'm going to. Uh, ask Chris, let Christine answer, and again, those of you who haven't been able to answer each of our questions, uh, I hope we'll have the round table to continue. Christine, I then actually, I have Raju and Nita. I actually wasn't going to answer anything I was going to ask. Is that okay? What? I was going to ask a question, not answer one. <laughs> so I had, actually building on this conversation, first of all, thank you, all of you, for your presentations. Uh, building on this discussion, I wanted to make two observations. One is, even if the ethical principles don't change, and as I think Dr. Korish has said, some of the questions are the same questions, just with new twists to them, it seems like maybe there are two levels at which there might be some important changes to talk about and recognize. One is conceptual, because you talked about privacy, for example, might have different meanings than it used to. Uh, even respect for persons, maybe persons might have different meanings, consciousness might have different, you know, different concepts that we may have to revisit. So that's one level I think I'd love to hear your thoughts about. And the other level is what Dr. Wingfield just referred to, you know, the specific rules and guidelines that we currently use for human subject review, for animal subject review. I mean, the question is whether or not they're adequate for the kinds of technologies and the kinds of science that we're um, already starting and anticipating in the future. Would anyone like to comment, uh, Dr. Chalmers? Yeah, maybe I could uh, connect that to uh, what Dr. Gutman raised earlier about uh, potentially ne neglected um, issues of concern. I mean, some of the ethical issues that get raised by all this are sort of obvious privacy, uh, mind control, enhancement. Some of them are less obvious and may well sneak up on us. And um, you mentioned the uh, changes in the conception of a, uh, of a person. I mean, many of the issues which have snuck up on us in the past have roughly come by expanding our conception of a, a person or an object of ethical concern. We started, you know, you start with maybe with members of your local village or members of your, uh, your nation members of your race, and expands out to all of humanity, and now we're very sensitive to ethical issues concerning non-human animals. This is this expanding circle of concern that people have thought about. I want to connect this to uh, something that Dr. Casebeer mentioned, which is you know, DARPA is starting to think about work on emulations and simulations. And right now, we just don't think about that as a potential object of ethical concern in its own right. You don't need to you don't think about the machine that your simulation is running on as a uh, potential object of ethical concern. But at some point, this is going to become at least a question that needs to be, uh, that needs to be raised. I mean, certainly once we get to the point of, say, recording a whole human's brain state on a computer and simulating it, we're at least going to have to raise the question as a simulated person, a person with its own, uh, with its own ethical value, even before then, if we start doing our studies on uh, simulating the brains of mice in pain. Is a simulated mouse feeling pain? And if so, do we need to think about ethical guidelines for our use of computer simulations? Now this, of course, it sounds like science fiction now and it sounds a bit way out, but this is precisely the kind of question that ends up sneaking up on you. And in retrospect, people say, you know, what were they thinking then? So at some point, someone's gonna to have to be thinking about that issue, if not now, then in a decade. And I guess this is the commission for, for doing it. Raju? Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, uh, the, the discussion so far. And, and I uh, heard uh, from s some of you addressing the sorts of uh, ethical issues with the developments of the new technologies. Uh, what I wanted to ask all of you is that uh, 
are the sets of issues that uh, we should be concerned about fundamentally different than all of the technological things that happened uh, in biological sciences over the 30 or 40 years? In my academic career, i give you some examples of them. Uh, in the 1970s, you know, the discovery of the recombinant DNA technology, you know, really raised a, 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 a tremendous sets of issues. Uh, and, uh, you know, <clears throat> a city where, you know, uh, where my university is, you know, shut down uh, actually uh, being able to do a recombinant DNA research until the NIH came along with the guidelines and sort of things, you know, quieted down many of those issues. Some of the issues were dealt with. But, you know, a consequence of all the recombinant DNA technology was genetically modified foods, and we're still dealing with, uh, you know, that, those sets of issues throughout the world, lots of ethical issues about, you know, uh, about that. Or late, a little bit later on, when the Human Genome Project was launched in 1990, uh, there was also a whole sets of issues about the technology, what it would do. And we're still dealing with those types of issues. That the, our commission's uh, you know, deliberations yesterday really deal with one aspect of you know, the consequences of that. And it, it sort of mentioned about uh, stem cell biology uh, and uh, the implications of the ethical issues and so on and so forth. And the commission was mentioned that, you know, earlier, one of the first things that we tackled was about synthetic biology. E each of these really dealt with a, a new technology that, you know, raised uh, ethical issues, but at least uh, this commission sort of felt that there were some basic fundamental principles of ethics that need to be able to be considered, and that the framework is the same for all of these different things. Uh, but the question for you is that whether you know, the technologies that we're talking about in the Brain Initiative are fundamentally different uh, in, in, in thinking about the ethical issues or whether they're the same. That's a great question. Um, my opinion is that there is not much new under the sun in this domain and that the principles that uh, come from both the East and the West, all right, from the ethical tradition of the West, as well as things like the Confucian tradition, um, can speak to a lot of the issues that we'll be confronting uh, in, in the brain project. So uh, the three C's idea is one that I think is built on that touchstone that um, some of the traditional tools we use for moral analysis can be applied in this domain uh, as equally effectively as they have been in other domains. So um, I think that any differences you see will be mostly of degree rather than uh, of kind. Uh, so take, for example, the notion of uh, mind control that we discussed earlier or the notion of mind reading. Um, you know, it's well known in the cognitive sciences that we actually have faculties mentally that are designed to help us understand the mental states of others. Uh, it's called theory of mind. Uh, it's what allows us to make inferences about somebody else's intentions as they approach us. It's what allows us to make inferences about whether someone's feeling pain so that I can be empathic and so on. So I, I, I think that the issues we struggle with as we think about how brain understanding uh, will influence issues of mind control are going to be a lot like those of um, what do we do about interactions between individuals where one individual might be especially good at sensing bodily signals and tells related to making inferences about someone else's mental states. So uh, I don't think that there will be that much new under the sun. It will be a difference of uh, degree uh, rather than of kind. Although I will say that in the popular uh, mind, I think there are certain uh, notions about the received image of humanity that the brain project might challenge, and that can lead to some discomfort or uh, a feeling that uh, some of our traditional tools of ethical analysis might not fit well. Uh, so uh, dualist assumptions, assumptions about uh, the nature of mental states that would make the study of the brain entirely irrelevant to the study of the mind. I think those, if, if you if your background framework comes preloaded with some of those assumptions, then you might think we have something radically new here. Nita? 
Uh, so first, thank you for these presentations. I think it uh, just underscores what an exciting time we are in um, and the tremendous developments that we can anticipate over time. Um, I do worry a lot about neurohype. Uh, and neuroethics is an area that I spend a lot of my own personal focus in. Um, and so I wanted to gauge from your presentations if um, a characterization that I'm going to present to you kind of makes sense as to the current state of the science and where we are. So um, if we kind of break down into a few different categories, awareness of what's happening in the brain, access to the brain, and alteration of the brain. And think of those on a spectrum, right? Build the foundational awareness knowledge, then um, you know, what are the things we could learn from access to, interrogating the brain, reading off memories, if there's such a thing as a stable memory, um, and then alteration of the brain. Um, we are still, from my perspective, in the infant stages of awareness of the brain. Um, we have made some inroads into access to the brain and being able to decode what's happening there from the kinds of studies that Dr. Chalmers points to, some of the extraordinary work that people like Jack Gallant are doing at UC Berkeley. Um, and we've made some modest inroads into alterations of the brain in some crude ways from being able to do things like um, you know, transcranial drug current stimulation or drugs or things like that. But those latter two categories, a lot of the different ethical issues that we raise, like mind control and interrogation, all presumes that we could do those things surreptitiously without the consent, awareness, and full compliance of individuals. And we're nowhere close to being able to do anything like that in those latter two categories. Um, so is it fair, is my characterization of this fair, which is we're really, I mean, the brain initiative is really squarely first and foremost about trying to develop a baseline awareness. And that while it's really important for us to think about and grapple with these issues about access and alteration and that they are part of the goal once we've developed awareness, that those are developmentally in the future kinds of issues and we're not there in anywhere close to being able to do things like control, interrogate, uh, observe memories, violate the privacy in the brain, things like that. Is that fair? Dr. Chalmers? Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, I think you're, I think what you say is pretty well accurate from, uh, from, at least from my perspective. I think there's a good chance that in about 100 years' time, people in, you know, in, say, in the golden age of neuroscience, people will uh, look back on the uh, early 21st century as a period of prehistory, and in some senses of the, uh, the science, because we lack, at the moment, a unifying theory, and because, um, we're so much in the dark about the, both the underlying mechanisms and the connections between uh, between brain and mind. At the same time, I think that the uh, what the Brain Initiative promises is, I mean, if we really get to the point where we can monitor the uh, the neuron by neuron state of the uh, of the brain and analyze it at that level in the context of also monitoring um, you know, states of behavior and so on, we can expect that that kind of technology, if it works out, will actually put us in a position to start delivering. On, uh, on that hype and maybe actually entering into that, uh, that golden age. So once again, I think it's probably a case where the, the hype is just a few decades in advance of the reality. Yeah. I, I would agree. Um, the only caveat I would say is that um, in, in the history of looking at how the brain is functioning, the people who take care of patients who have brain diseases are always trying to make a leap. And so there are things, like I mentioned, you know, identifying areas in the brain associated with depression and then turning them off, that works. There is no reason, inherent reason, to think that you couldn't think of five other areas that you could go after for a certain purpose. So I think that, the, that, that ethical issues will be broken, my sense, by studies in disease patients to interrogate and then alter the brain. And then the hype comes from, oh man, they can do this and now they can make me really happy and you know, more productive in society, so why don't I go to China and have this area stimulated? So I think that's, that's kind of the caricature which would worry me. Yeah, I've been quoted previously as saying there are snake oil salespeople in every area and when you have breakthroughs of the application that are really positive, which you have, there is the ethical concern of people who, it's not just an intellectual concern, but the ethical concern of people 
who are out there selling things that not only can't deliver but have real real harm. I mean that that's not new to this field. Uh, that's why I began prefaced it by being there's snake oil salesmen in every field. But this is the more promising a field is in its actual ability to do some things, the more you know worrisome it becomes that we don't want it to be um, deterred because of the people who are abusing it. So that's really good. For those of you who are hoping for a break, we've decided, we, the Vice Chair and I made an executive decision that we're going to go right into the next session when we conclude this one, that we don't really need a break since you've stimulated our brains and minds so well here. But before we do go into the next session and before we thank all of you, I do have a question from a member of the audience that I want to read. It's from Dr. James Giordano. Uh, Dr. Giordano, where are you? Um, thank you for this, who is at the Pellegrino Center for um, Bioethics at Georgetown. Um, he's the chief of, neuro, of the Neuroethics Study Program there. And uh, the question is as follows. Um, Given that neuroscience and neurotechnology are becoming ever more international, in research and applications, might we consider cosmopolitanism as a possible fourth C that is important to the development, discourse, and articulation of neuroethics? Dr. Wingfield. Yeah, the, the international um, issues are, are huge, especially since the UK, uh, well, the European Commission has uh, launched its own brain, human brain initiative and uh, um, so that there are huge issues here and I j just want to point to one possible bright spot there is the formation of the Global Research Council which was convened at the NSF in May last year and they had a meeting this year in Berlin there will be one next year in in Beijing it's now expanded from uh, 40 countries I think to something like 80 uh, that this would be a place where we could start to focus on uh, um, international dialogue and coordination on these issues. And we will certainly want to call upon an international group, and we have a somewhat international group right here to thank right now. So thanks to Drs. Chalmers, Koroshetz, Wingfield, and Case Beer. Thank you. It was really terrific. <laughs>